We continue into Psalm 32 this week. Um, in our, it's the last of our series for this summer, the summer in the Psalms, and next week we begin in First Thessalonians. But I'm so glad we ended up this year in Psalm 32. It is my favorite psalm. It is my favorite psalm. And it is the one, of course, Paul quotes in Romans chapter 4, a passage that was instrumental in me finally understanding the gospel. As I was a pastor, an associate pastor at a church, sitting in my office listening to a podcast, the podcast was called The White Horse Inn, and, and with the fellow, the Lutheran pastor who introduced me to that podcast, uh, he said, uh, I asked, what, what's it called? He said, it's The White Horse Inn, you really need to listen to it. And I was thinking, can anything good come out of White Horse? <laughs> Not realizing that it wasn't at all from White Horse Canada, it was uh, named after where the uh, Reformation took, uh, sort of sank down roots um, uh, through discussions and debate in White, the White Horse Inn in England during the English Reformation. So anyway, uh, Romans 4, where, David, where Paul, Paul quotes David here, uh, became a, a very powerful passage in my life. Um, and I want to share that with you this morning. So Psalm 32, let's pray. Father, you are so good to us. What a marvelous design that you have uh, built into your plan of salvation that as we are saved, Lord, as your mercy extends to those of us who are heavy with guilt and shame, uh, for whom, Lord, it seems that we, we certainly echo that cry of Paul, that there seems to be a law at work that when I do want to do right, evil lies close at hand. And for those of us, Lord, who in the midst of that crisis, Lord, as we feel the guilt and we feel not only self-condemnation, but we feel that we are justly uh, condemned by your law that we reach out to you as Paul again does in Romans 7. He says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so this morning, Father, I pray that conviction will turn to freedom, that, that the plight of our sin, Lord, that the despair that we have felt and wrestled with will turn into a sense of lightheartedness, happiness, joy at being forgiven because of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. I pray, Father, that your gospel will be very clear here this morning and that nothing might distract us or keep us from understanding that wonderful good news. Not for our sake alone, but for your glory, Lord, we pray, because you're glorified to save sinners. And for that, we praise your name. Amen. The thing is that a lot of people come to churches, uh, especially in tourist uh, attract attracting towns like Victoria, uh, who maybe do not know Christ. Maybe you've walked in a church this morning and you're really not sure uh, about this whole Christianity thing, much less whether there is a God. My best friend uh, grew up in a Christian home. His dad was a pastor. And my best friend, after he became a scientist, he's, he became an atheist. Um, and uh, that's what engineering will do to you. No, not really, not really. We have a number of engineers in our congregation or uh, closely connected to us, but it did for him. And we wrestled with the existence of God and debated it back and forth, and I mustered all the arguments I could find in the big, thick, heavy books written by long-dead people and uh, presented those arguments to him, and he seemed to have answers for so many of those arguments. There was one thing, though, that he never did have an answer for. He said to me, I don't understand, Joe. You're a smart guy. He said, how can you still believe in God? And I said, I can't not believe in God after experiencing the grace that I've experienced. I, uh, it's, not, it's not just intellectual. It is intellectual, yeah, but there's so much more than that. My I said to my friend, I'll, I won't use his name. And he said, he said, what do you mean by Grace. And I described to him how I felt about God's grace. And he had tears in his eyes. This was, he, he now says he no longer remembers having that conversation with me. I find that convenient. Uh, but uh, at the time, he said, he, he, with tears in his eyes, he said, I have no idea what you're talking about when you describe grace like that. The thing is, if there is a creator, we would be reasonable to suppose that there should be such a thing as judgment. Because if there is a creator, he has rights over his creation, right? That's reasonable. That's logical. 
And if there's a creator and he has rights over his creation, everything in it, it's all his, he made it, he can do what he wants with it, then we would expect to be held accountable for how we have treated him. That's also logical, isn't it? So judgment day is very reasonable, it's a very reasonable supposition if God exists and if he created the universe. We would have expected to be judged. So we would have never expected, it would have been a complete surprise to discover that God is good news. But from the third chapter of Genesis, God entered, which is really close to the beginning of the Bible, if you don't know, God introduces himself there to the human race as rescuer and provider. Genesis 3.15 hints at that in verse 21 as well. And long before the people of Israel ever knew God as lawgiver, which is how many people in the Western world imagine God as a great stern lawgiver. The people of Israel, their forefathers, long before that, had known him as a shepherd. In Genesis 48, 15, we see that in Jacob's words. And I've often talked with people who thought of the God of the Bible like a harsh king demanding our obedience or some kind of harsh ruler. People who thought of Christians as miserable followers, sheep, doing their duty. Have you heard that kind of, should we call it a caricature, stereotype? But if nothing else this morning, there's one thing I want to absolutely destroy. It's the notion that Christians are supposed to be miserable according to our religion. It's the notion that our God expects us to just do our duty whether we are happy about it or not. If, if I could take a stick of dynamite and blow something up, that's what I would want to blow up. I would love to see no more reason for us to be hypocrites who pretend to be happy or pretend to have it all together. I'd love to see us like the verse um, in Psalm <laughs> geez, there they go with these glasses again. Uh, in Psalm 32 verse 2 would you hold my Bible? Um, Psalm 32 verse 2 where David says in whose spirit there is no deceit. I'd love to see a congregation of people including myself who feel more and more freedom to not hide what we're going through, to not hide who we are, to not live under a cloud of deceit, not only deceiving ourselves and our loved ones and those closest to us, but also God. I'd love to see us be honest about who we are. We are sinners in need of great help. So I want to blow up that notion that says that we're supposed to be unhappy when I believe the Bible proves that that is not what we are called to do. I hope to give you enough reasons this morning that you begin to doubt a picture of a stern and angry lawgiver in the sky who's just waiting to whack you. And I hope to blow up that idea that we are meant to be miserable followers of Christ. So the main idea in this psalm written by King David, uh, the ancient king of Israel, is that if you stop resisting him, God will teach you happiness. That's, I think, the main idea in Psalm 32. If you stop resisting him, God will teach you happiness. And we can start to see that right in the introduction to verse 1. Not in verse 1, but in the introduction to verse 1. Like we saw last week, many psalms have a heading above the psalm, and this one has one as well. Do you see what it says? It says, a something of David. What does it say? A masculine. Isn't that great? Okay, so now we all are on the same page. Of course it says a masculine. This is the first time. If, if it's unfamiliar, it's no wonder. It's only used about a dozen times as headings to the Psalms. And this is the first one of those times when David writes a psalm and says, this is a masculine. And a masculine is, as far as we can tell, some kind of ancient musical term. We don't know exactly for what. But parsing the word, we can figure out it has something to do with teaching, instruction. So we see here that uh, the theological word book of the Old Testament says that this root idea of this verb, uh, masculine, in the verb form, it involves careful thinking, wise insight, and prudent action. So it's a poem, as we can tell, Psalm 32. It's a poem, it's a song to be sung, but it's also a teaching song. It's an instructional 
poem. It's meant to stir up deep thinking that somehow affects how we live. It should make a difference. What kind of difference should it make? What kind of thinking should it stir up? The answer is happiness. It should stir us to thinking about happiness and it should produce happiness in us as it affects us. I've divided uh, these verses into four stages God guides us through to teach us happiness and then at the end, two parts of a metaphor to help us know God better. So here it is. Here, Here, let's get going in this. Psalm 32. This is a masculine, it's a song to teach us about happiness. Let's start with the third stage. Because David's a poet. Uh, he's not, not to make fun of engineers, I'll stop with this. Uh, but an engineer would have ordered things sort of logically and chronologically. David starts with poetic effect and, and drama and sort of the impact it makes on us to read the psalm the way we do. But I've numbered this chronologically in the way we experience these stages. So this is the third thing we experience, but it's the first thing David mentions. We experience salvation here, and this is number three, freedom. Not freedom from God, but freedom from condemnation. As God leads us and begins to teach us through these stages of discovering happiness and discovering who he is, the third thing we experience, according to this psalm, is freedom, not from condemnation. I'm sorry, not from God, but freedom from condemnation. Look at verses 1 and 2 in Psalm 32. Blessed, and that from, from now on I'm going to translate this word happy, because it's, it's what, the, what the word basically means. Happy. Happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy is the man or woman, ladies. Happy is the man or woman against whom Yahweh, that is the Lord, counts no iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. This is what we're supposed to think about in this teaching song, this masculine. The first verse kind of detonates a massive idea in our little brains. This is where happiness is to be found. I was a Christian for a long time before I read these words and and quoted in Romans 4. And I was a relatively unhappy Christian, just trying, white-knuckled, to hold it all together. Can you imagine the mind change, the worldview shift that had to happen as I began to discover that God calls us to be happy in Him? That's the point of the Christian life. My sister can tell you that we didn't grow up in a very happy home. Right? Right? but we've been adopted into a happy family. Happy is this word blessed in verses 1 and 2. It's a different word for blessing used in the previous psalm in verse 21, but this word means happy. So when the queen of Sheba came and met Solomon, David's son, years later, she said, your servants must be so happy to be able to stand around and listen to your wisdom all day long. Some men think their wives must be happy to be able to sit around and listen to their wisdom all day long. (laughs) One thing we know is those wives have a good sense of humor. (laughs) Similarly, Proverbs 3.13 says, happy is the one who finds wisdom. And the one who gets understanding, that's my translation. These two verses show conditions for true happiness. If there is such a thing as true happiness, if it's attainable, how do we get it? These two verses give us two conditions for true happiness. And the first one is really counterintuitive. Did you look at these verses? Did you notice something? Verses 1 and 2. The road to freedom begins with the realization that we aren't free at all. You can't get free of slavery till you first wrestle with the fact that you're a slave. We start with the assumption that all people are sinners. We start with the assumption 
according to the scripture's teaching, that we have transgressions that need to be forgiven. Notice these words, sinners, transgressions, iniquity in verses 1 and 2. We have iniquity, and we start with this assumption. We have iniquity that God is fair to count this iniquity against us. The second condition, so that's the first one, to admit we're not free. The second condition here is that somehow our transgressions are forgiven. Somehow our sin is covered. Verses 1 and 2. Somehow... God himself does not count our iniquity against us. So freedom is to be free of this condemnation. Not ignorant of it, not pretending it's not there, not deluded, certainly not like, like um, defiant of God and refusing to say that we're guilty, shaking our fist at our creator. In these two verses, three different words are used for the idea of sin. The Hebrew word sin basically means, and it's in verse 1, it basically means a fault, a a lapse, to miss the target or to fail. The word transgression, also in verse 1, basically means to break the law. It's not really complicated. We know what that's all about, breaking the law. And the word iniquity basically means guilt. Guilt. So we need God, the second condition of finding freedom, of beginning to discover true happiness, we need God to somehow forgive our law-breaking, cover over our failures, and not count our guilt against us. And as I uh, sat with uh, Jennifer this week, she pointed out, and so I'm quoting Jennifer here. Here you go, Jennifer. There you are. Jennifer said, this applies to everything. There's nothing excluded there, and she's absolutely right. Every circumstance is covered here. There is nothing here, though, about being happy if only we don't get caught or manage to never fail. There's nothing mentioned here about having happiness if we just get away with it or if we never mess up really in the first place. This is not fiction. That would be fiction. This is not fiction. You know how I can tell? Because it says happy is the man. And we know no man has ever gone through life sinless and perfect. Well, one has, and he created us. The son of man, Jesus Christ. But no ordinary man. That was meant to be a joke. It kind of fell flat. This is not fiction. It's it's truth. This is about normal human men and women like us, warts and all. Hair growing out of our ears and all. That's maybe more of the men. But see, the fact, my friends, that we all have failures and wrongs. We all fail to live up to our own standards. Right? That fact, according to this, does not mean that happiness is impossible. It's not out of reach. In fact, the implication here is that once we begin to realize that, happiness is not far from us. The implication here is that admitting our wrongdoing is the first step to happiness. It's implied here, but it's made explicit in the next verse. And that leads me to the first stage. Notice how I'm following this completely out of order. The first stage. We go from the third stage to the first stage. Sounds like a Boston album. You're either too old for that or too young for that. I don't know. The way to avoid happiness is to never admit our transgressions, our sin, our iniquity. If we want to avoid happiness, keep on refusing to admit you've got transgressions that are a problem or sin that's a problem or iniquity that's a problem. Just pretend it's not there, ignore it, shake your fist at God, and you will successfully avoid happiness forever. But David looks back here on the lesson from his own experience and he shows that as long as he hid his sin, he was miserable. Look at verses 3 and 4. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. This makes sense of that confusing line at the end of verse 2. That the happy man, there's no deceit in his spirit. And I've often taken that to mean, what, you mean 
if I want to be happy, I've got to be completely truthful and have no deceitful practice in my life. And while it's very good to have no deceitful practice in your life, and it's wrong to have to practice deceit of any kind, we all do it. So is this saying that happiness is completely unattainable for us? No. David is talking about what he explains in the next two verses. To have deceit in our spirits is to hide from God. To hide the truth about ourselves and refuse to confess to the Lord that we are sinners. So he says in verse 3 and 4, I'll read it again. For when I kept silent, that was when he was practicing deceit or had deceit in his spirit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. And it gets so hot in the summertime, in some places. Not here, apparently. David describes those years where he was just racked with guilt. Like the guilt was killing him. And it almost sounds like a cancer, doesn't it? The way it's eating at his bones and destroying his body. I can kind of relate to that. Maybe you can too. I've had times in my life when I was not able to sleep because of a sense of shame or intense guilt. Conviction. That's something that I was hiding. What is it that makes a guilty person unable to sleep? What is it that makes even a sweet child miserable until she finally tells the truth? Do you know what I'm talking about? What is it that makes a criminal feel the need to confess? Why does every bad guy in every superhero or villain movie, why does every bad guy finally tell his great evil plan and how, how he planned it and he did it deliberately? And, and why does every person who's caught finally seem to feel free when they divulge the truth? Even if we invent all kinds of reasons to pretend that there's no God, there's no creator, the heart knows otherwise. The human heart knows the truth that right and wrong are more than just some kind of inventions of society, some kind of human construct. And so it seems to me, and there's great books about, like the, about that, like Paul Chamberlain's book we've got on the back table, Can We Be Good Without God, that wrestles with the, the ideas of good. What is good? Where does it come from? How can we, we all know what the idea of God somehow is about? It seems to me it's about impossible for an atheist to really be sure that there is no God who designed us with a sense of moral accountability. That's something you can't prove. It really takes a lot of certainty to have that kind of doubt. Charles Spurgeon said that he thought this psalm comes after Psalm 51, and that was interesting to me. Psalm 51 is written after David was convicted and caught in his sin against Bathsheba and murdering Bathsheba's husband to cover up their affair. When Nathan the prophet came and confronted David and Psalm 51 was written, and Spurgeon thinks this psalm comes after that psalm in, in David's life order, in his story. So 2 Samuel 11 And 12 doesn't tell us exactly how long David covered up his sin. But we know it was long enough for that affair to turn into a child. They had a child through that adultery. And Nathan talks about the child. Nathan the prophet. So there's at least many months. We don't know how old the child was that that it becomes the subject of that passage. But not necessarily an infant. Could have been a young child. Many months if not years. And David hid his guilt the whole time. And he covered it up the whole time. And he tried to hide it from himself and from his God the whole time. Can you imagine the guilt and the stress that David was feeling? Can you imagine what that was like for those many months or years to lie awake and not be able to sleep well and have no peace? And that's probably not hard for us to imagine. And that's why I called this stage, the first stage, the crisis. Because of the deceit in his spirit as he hid this from God. My friends, make no mistake about this. Make no mistake. God leads us through these times when we can't find peace. 
in order to teach us how to find true peace at last. Let's go to the second stage. The breakthrough. Look at verse 5 with me. This second stage is good. In verse 5, David says, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to Yahweh, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. That last phrase has to be read with, like, incredulity. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. You forgave the guilt of my failure. It's kind of amazing to me that even though God had sent the prophet David or Nathan to confront King David, God still forgave David. If Nathan had not told David a story, if Nathan had not told David a story and trapped him in his own hypocrisy, there's no telling how long it might have taken David to finally confess. But God sent the prophet and the prophet came and he told this very sad story about a sheep and appealed to David's shepherd heart. And about this man who was cruel and abusive. And at the end of the story, David cried out, that man deserves to die. And Nathan the prophet said, you are that man. And began to show how the story was really an allegory about his own sin. Nathan convicted David. And David said to Nathan in 2 Samuel, I have sinned against Yahweh. And Nathan said to David these wonderful words, Yahweh has also put away your sin. You shall not die. 2 Samuel twelve thirteen. Now look at the end of verse 5 in our psalm, Psalm 32. Look at the end of the verse. After David kind of responds to that or remembers that you forgave the iniquity of my sins, he writes this word, Selah. Which again is a musical term. We don't know entirely what it means, but we're pretty sure it means pause. Take a deep breath and let that sink in. Pause. It seems appropriate here. If David's confession to Nathan is the confession that he's talking about in verse 5, it seems appropriate to pause. Because David's sins, murder and covering it up, not only the adultery, his sins resulted in some really devastating consequences for a lot of people. Probably those sins and the the hypocrisy of covering it up even spoiled his effectiveness as a father to his children, as we read between the lines in 2 Samuel, much less to his ability to govern his people. David's crimes cost him his reputation. He became a laughingstock to the nation of Israel. But his confession saved his soul. That's, I think, for many of us, something we've got to wrestle with. What do I want more? My reputation or my soul? Selah. Pause and let that sink in. Notice though in verse 5. I acknowledge my sin. I did not cover my iniquity. I confessed my transgressions. All the same three words for sin that verses 1 and 2 use about the man who has finally discovered happiness. Who has finally discovered freedom. Happy is that man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. All three words David uses there. God forgave him. And his reputation continued to be tarnished for a long time. Israel knew him as a hypocrite, a failure in many ways. Nonetheless, the failure that God had put on the throne and they eventually came back to follow him and support him. 
Can God use messed up, broken, former hypocrites who've finally been crushed and humbled and repented on their knees and asked God for mercy? Can God use people like that? Do you know how I know God can use people like that? Not, it's not only because he's still using me. It's because the Bible was written by people. Every single person who wrote a page of, or a word of scripture under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was a person just like that. And God is certainly still using the scriptures. The fourth stage. The lesson. So you see the order now. One, two, three, four. That's the order that we experience these things, these stages in. But David writes them, the third stage first, and then he talks about the crisis and then the breakthrough. And now we get the lesson. Some of the best old stories have an important lesson to teach, a moral to the story. Except for anything we find on Netflix, apparently. The moral of this story is found in verses 6 to 7. Look at the beginning of verse 6. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. The reason I think this is kind of the lesson of the passage is because it starts with that word, therefore. That's the reason for everything David's written before. Let everyone who is godly pray to you at the right time when you may be found. So if we pay careful attention to David's own story, how God forgave his transgressions, how God covered his sin, and how God did not count David's iniquity against him, it leads us to the discovery of this principle that God is ready to hear our prayers for forgiveness. He's ready. Don't put it off any longer. Now might be the time. A time when God may be found does not mean, in this verse, it does not mean that God is no longer somehow present, but that if we persist in hiding our sin and resisting God and refusing to confess and not answering his call, he will eventually give us over to our guilt and judge us accordingly. You see, even in human courts, after the judge bangs his gavel and reads out his verdict, it's too late to accuse, for the accused to plead guilty and fall on the mercy of the court. That time has passed. But if you're listening to these words, and if God's hand is heavy on your soul, and you're finally ready to confess, it's not too late yet for you. The time is now, not tomorrow. You don't know when God will call you to account for your life. But look at the middle of verse 6. All the way down to verse 7. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I want you to pause there for the sake of this image and put yourself there. Imagine yourself standing with your eyes closed and all around you, you hear these shouts of deliverance. What does that mean? means people shouting because they're happy that they've been saved, that they've been delivered. So picture it, listen to it. You hear people shouting, men, women, teenagers with cracking voices. And you hear the shouts of deliverance around you. Rushing waters are a common Old Testament metaphor for times of judgment when God uses bad things, enemies and disasters to get his people's attention and to bring them back to repentance. Scripture often uses this idea of flood waters or rushing waters or torrents. And David used this, the same picture in his prayer in 2 Samuel 22 and listen to verse, the parts of his prayer verses 5 to 7 in 2 Samuel 22 he said for the waves of death encompassed me the torrents of destruction assailed me the cords of Sheol the grave entangled me the snares of death confronted me in my distress I called upon Yahweh to my God I called from his temple he heard my voice and my cry came to his ears 
And then down just a little bit, he says, he sent from on high. He took me. He drew me up out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but Yahweh was my support. David didn't only realize that God had led him through the crisis, the breakthrough, to the freedom of forgiveness, only to keep it all to himself and not talk about it, only to keep this lesson to himself and not share what it meant to others. Notice in verse 6, when David says, Therefore, from there on he's praying to God. It's not just him telling us a lesson. He says, Therefore, let everyone who's godly pray to you. He's talking to God. He's praying to God. I feel there should be a Selah there. Why would David pray to God that people would pray to God? The truth is actually really wonderful. It's because we need God's help to pray to him. Otherwise, we'll never bend, we'll never yield, we'll never bow our knee. We'll continue to try to be our own little kings and queens and rule our own little lives until it's too late and we realize we never could in the first place. David says here, Lord, Lord, help people to pray to you. Can we say amen to that? Father, help us to pray to you. So David's talking to God. God, that you would help every humble sinner come to the point of bending the knee and bowing the head and confessing our sin to such a faithful Savior as David's God. Oh God, answer this prayer. So in verse 7, we could pray it. You are my Savior God. And with David, we praise you, you who have preserved us through times of trouble, and you've taught us to trust you. And with David, O Lord, I want to hear around me the the shouts, the happy shouts of people who are discovering your forgiveness, who are realizing they've been delivered by Jesus, whose sins you have not counted against them, whose guilt you have forgiven. And what word lies at the end of verse 6, or verse 7, I mean? Selah. Pause and let that sink in. After giving us these stages of how God leads us to discover freedom, how he leads us to discover true happiness in him, David then turns and gives us two parts of a metaphor to help us picture what God is like so we know him better. The first one is the shepherd in verses 8 and 9. And I said at the beginning of the sermon that this metaphor in two parts is about helping us know God better. But the purpose of the whole Bible is to reveal God to us so that we will enjoy him forever, the old Westminster Confession of Faith said. Even the purpose of the gospel itself, and I hope this isn't too shocking, the purpose of the gospel is not just to save us. The purpose of the gospel is to save us for an eternal happiness of knowing God personally in Jesus Christ, of being with him, of having God. So when David prays in verses 6 to 7, Lord, this is my paraphrase, please enable sinners to turn to you and be saved. Surround me with the shouts of the people you're saving. God answered David's prayer. And this is a really remarkable thing. In verse 8, the Holy Spirit, who's inspiring this psalm, who's giving David the words here, who's speaking through David's pen. However we picture that process of divine inspiration, it's something like that. But look what's happening. The Holy Spirit who's giving David these words is answering the prayer that David just prayed through David's pen. David's writing down God's answer. 
It's quite incredible. I feel like we gloss over these things and don't pay attention to them too often. But look at verses 8 and 9. God answers and says to David, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like, which means don't be like, don't be like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle or it will not stay, to, stay near to you. And remember, God is talking here to a former shepherd who knows all about sheep and the, 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 the implication of this metaphor is pretty clear to David. He knows God saying, be like a sheep, not like a mule. I was going to say the other word for donkeys and whatnot, but I thought, nah, we are a Mennonite church after all. In verse 9, we get here from the, from the Holy Spirit, we finally get a picture that compares the way God watches over us and teaches his people to the way a shepherd watches his sheep. Because in verse 9, God tells David to be careful that he doesn't become like horses or mules that need to be forced to stay close to their masters. And this former shepherd got it. The sheep know the sound of their shepherd's voice when he calls them. And they enjoy the safety and the comfort of his presence with them. Oh, my friends. God promises here to teach David the way, the way to go. Where to go. And to counsel him while watching over him. That's really wonderful that God would do that for us. But this gets even better. God says this through, to David and David writes it for us. That's why we have this psalm written for us. It's for our benefit. How big a gap is there then between the way you thought about God, maybe as a harsh ruler and judge ready to crush you, and the way the Bible here actually presents God. If you're going to reject God, make sure you're rejecting the real thing and not your imagination of what God is like. Maybe this is the reason that you've been resisting him. Being afraid to be open with him about your transgressions, your sin, and your guilt. What difference might it make to all of us right now to finally realize that he loves you and is ready to protect you forever like the great shepherd of the sheep that he is who gave his own life to save yours. Don't you long to hear the words that David heard? Your sins have been forgiven. Which leads us to the last point. The second part of the metaphor is the pasture. Not the pastor, but the pasture. The end of this masculine, this marvelous teaching psalm gives us the second part of this picture to know God better. God gives us a picture of what it's like to stay close to our shepherd. And it's contrasted with what it is like to remain on the outside of his pasture. Look at verse 10. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds. Steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. We are a bit like sheep, and so we're stubborn, and we smell bad, and we're kind of dumb, and we think the grass really is greener over there. And that outside of those fences, there's freedom. But those, freedom, those fences, rather, are not there to keep us from being happy. Those fences are there to preserve our happiness. Outside of God's presence, in the dark that's beyond his pasture, and away from his side, this psalm tells us you will discover many sorrows. That will be the end of it. You will discover many sorrows. Sure, you, you might find some seasons of fleeting pleasure. There might be little spots of okay grass. But lasting joy will always elude you. I don't want to sit at the bedside of another dying patient who simply does not know Christ and is fearful 
and regretful and bitter at what, is, what life has given. At death's door, when you look back on your life and you see your years, you will see them characterized by what you will have lost if you've insisted on wandering outside the Lord's pasture. But it doesn't have to be that way, and that's the point. Look at verse 11. This is a command. Are we willing to obey? This is a command in verse 11. Be glad in the Lord. It's a really happy command. I love getting told to do this. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Your shepherd is calling your name. And he's telling you to be happy. If you come to the sound of his voice, if you listen to his word of salvation, if you respond to his offer of forgiveness, verse 10 says that you will find yourself surrounded in a really good way. You'll be surrounded. Do you see that in verse 10? What are you surrounded with in verse 10? Steadfast love. It'll surround you. The dependable love of God. You will know his love when you turn to the left. You will know his love when you turn to the right. You will know his love and experience his love tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that and the day after that. Above you, below you, behind you, before you, yesterday, today, forever. Christ Jesus is the same. He loves his sheep. So obey. Be glad. Do what your master has told you to do, you upright in heart. Do you know why David calls us upright in heart there? It's not because our hearts are completely upright. It's because our hearts are learning. We're beginning to realize that being close to our master is good. We're beginning to choose to stay close to our shepherd. And that's an upright thing to do. Secondly, Paul says it in Romans 4 where he quotes from this passage. We're not only upright in heart as we're learning, we're upright in status as God has said, because you've trusted my shepherd, because you've confessed your sins and put your hopes in his uh, work for you in the cross to forgive your sins, because you've trusted Jesus, he now counts us as righteous. So we're legally righteous as we're becoming upright in heart. And he says, be glad. We are learning to long for and learning to love the one who created us. The one whose very existence is where we got the ideas about love and goodness and happiness. The God who is our Savior and Shepherd. Our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the embodiment of good news. Isn't he? Happiness, then, is not something God gives. Happiness is when God gives us himself. Be happy. Heavenly Father, my prayer at the end of this psalm, this beautiful psalm, is just this, Lord. It's amen. Lord, Let the godly pray to you. Help us. Take away the reasons why we've been hiding our sin and help us to see that they don't matter in the end. What matters is the salvation of our souls and not trying to protect a reputation that really doesn't mean much anyway. Not trying to keep the stuff that we've managed to build in our own lives that's going to fall apart anyway. But Lord, to be close to you and to know you forever, to walk in your pastures all the days of our lives and into eternity beyond. Oh, Father, open our eyes that we could choose what is right. Humble our hearts, Lord, that we could confess our sins. Encourage our spirits, Lord, with the echoes of Scripture and the promises your sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ. Trust him. Father, let this be our amen. In Jesus' name.